Okay, we are back for part two of the macrophage cytokines video. Last time we talked about how the monocyte differentiates into two types of macrophage, macrophage type 1 and macrophage type 2. We did the video talking about the cytokines for macrophage type 1, and this time we're going to look at macrophage type 2. So instead of seeing macrophages that like to kill and cause inflammation, we're going to see macrophages that like to repair and do anti-inflammatory activities. So here, if we look at this chart, we can see that this is called the alternate activated macrophage. The other one was the classically activated macrophage, or the M1. This is our M2. So where's our M2? It's at the bottom left here. So let's take a look at it. M2, our repair macrophage, well, what does it do to repair? It can secrete VEGF, or growth factor, along with a lot of other things. And we'll be getting to that in the future, but if you just wanted to know why is it called the repair macrophage, well, it can secrete those things to help with repair. We can also start with the mac macrophage's good friend up here, the mast cell. And if we look at the mast cell, we can see there are a lot of little pockets in here that hold histamine. And there's lots of ways to activate a mast cell. Apparently one of the easiest ways is to just scratch your arm. And it will release histamine, proteoglycan, and tryptase. And that will all go to the tissue and cause the general response you're used to with histamines. Up here on the top of the mast cell, you can see that it has FC epsilon R1 receptors. And this bacteria here has some uh, IgE bound to it, and so the FCE or FC epsilon R1 receptor picked it up, and there are ITAMs inside on the inside of these FC epsilon 1, and when that's activated, it tells the mast cell to release its histamine. And when it releases its histamine, it also releases IL4. And you can see there's a lot of IL4 on this page. The first place it goes, or one of the places, is down here to this macrophage, and it will tell the undifferentiated monocyte to become a macrophage type 2. Also, that IL-4 can come over here to a T cell, and it can tell a undifferentiated naive T cell to become a T helper 2 cell. You can also say, well, what if there's no macrophage, or, I mean, what if there's no mast cell? How else are we going to get a T type 2? Well, older ones, older TH2 cells, like this one with a beard here, this guy was activated maybe a long time ago. And so this T helper 2 cell also secretes interleukin-4, and that can tell this one, hey, why don't you be a T helper 2 cell just like me? So we've got IL-4 coming off here, we've got IL-4 coming off the mast cell, and we've got IL-4 coming off the mast cell going down to the macrophage. So there's a lot of IL-4. And if that weren't enough, this new T helper cell 2 can make some more IL-4 and also tell some monocytes to become macrophage type 2. So they're all on the same page. Everybody knows this is going to be an anti-inflammatory activity they're all going to be doing together. Once this uh, T helper 2 cell is clear about its job being a T helper 2 cell, and we notice that it secreted IL-4 down to the macrophage, it can also secrete some IL-4 and talk to B cells. And what does that do? Well, on this pathway you can see IL-4 and IL-13 can tell the B cell to stop making IgM and make IgE instead. Another possibility is for it to secrete IL-4 and something else, we don't know, and it will make IgG-4. So, in general you can remember that this IL-4 coming off the T helper 2 cell tells B cells to do the heavy chain class switching and change IgM into either IgE or IgG4. And we'll come back to the B cell in a minute. The T helper 2 cell can also secrete interleukin 5. So it's not 4 anymore, now it's 5. And that will tell the eosinophil over here to get to work. And what does the eosinophil do? Well, it has two jobs, or two pathways. There's the whoops pathway that I, I created, and then there's the normal pathway. And the normal pathway here is if you have a helminth invade your body, 
It will release proteases and major basic protein to try and kill the helminth. Or you don't really have any helminths and your eosinophils are bored and don't know what to do and they just kind of whoops and now you've got allergies. So that's what IL-5 does. Now if we look over here at the B cell, we notice that it can do class switching, but we're also just going to talk a little bit about some antibodies on the B cell. You can see here that a bacteria was caught by an antibody here, and that antibody bound to the FC gamma R2B. And so if that's the gamma receptor, then that's an IgG. And look, we just made IgG up here. So they're kind of, kind of related. What does the IgG do? Well, after it activates the FC gamma R2B, that activates ITIM. And if you remember, there's also a B cell antigen receptor that might have also bound to it. And that will normally have an ITAM on it. And ITAM will normally connect with Ig alpha and Ig beta, and that will send down a signal pathway for NFAT or NF kappa B or MYC or AP-1 to go into the nucleus and cause some things to happen. But if this receptor is bound, Fc gamma R2B, then ITIM will actually tell ITAM to turn off. So Tim goes and tells Tam to turn off. So if there's no Tim, then Tam's going to keep going. And it kind of makes sense because if this receptor is active, it means that you already have antibodies floating around that are going to be able to capture and uh, stop this guy. Whereas if you don't have these guys floating around and you just have this receptor, then this B cell is going to say, hey, I know who this guy is, but there are no antibodies yet. I should get busy making some antibodies. So this was the alternate activated macrophage, the M2, and there's just a couple other things on another page that we're going to cover since this is all about cytokines. This is the extra page. So we also have IL-7, and pretty much it just tells memory cells to stay alive. So memory cells wouldn't last very long unless they were told to stay alive, and that's what IL-7 does. The next thing that we're going to look at is interferon alpha and beta. And so in the middle here, you can see that we have a cell that was invaded by a virus. We have the virus at the top, and he's sad because he's going to die. Who's going to kill him? Any ideas? Well, if he stops presenting self-antigen on MHC class 1 and starts presenting some of this viral antigen, then a CD8 plus T cell is going to come and kill him. So his days are numbered. But he's a nice cell, so he tells his neighbors, hey neighbors, you don't want to uh, die a sad death like I'm going to, so I'm going to secrete interferon alpha and beta. And if you have receptors to pick them up, which you should, then you'll know that there's a virus in the area and you need to lock down your cells. And so if they pick those up, they're going to say no to the viruses, and what are they going to do? They're going to inhibit protein synthesis, they're going to degrade viral RNA in the cell via RNAs, and they're going to inhibit viral gene expression. So they're just going to do their best to stop up all the viruses' plans for invading and doing bad things. So hopefully you learned some new cytokines and had some fun. Have a good day.